Welcome back to another episode with Berta Dotto. Throughout this week, we have been talking about getting you ready to get back into your medical practices as um, certain states are almost completely reopening and some are partially reopening. And those of you who are closed, you need to be considering all these same factors. So we've been lucky enough to have great guests come along and really talk about different areas from what do you consider with your employees or what do you consider um, as, as you communicate with your patients. And so today we have another special guest and I'd love, Michael, for you to introduce our special guest. Today we have a repeat offender, I mean <laughs> guest. Uh, our partner, Jeff Siegel, is a partner at Bertadato. He's been on maybe two of these videos here in the last bit. Uh, Jeff is also the uh, founder and CEO of Medical Justice and eMerit. And uh, we've known Jeff for many years, even before being partners, sharing the podium across the country. Jeff is uh, well connected with. Uh, the, in this space and uh, is a great partner and has a different perspective with his both medical and legal perspective. Great. Great to join you. Thanks for the invitation. And Jeff, one of the things we've always loved about you is that you were a physician before you became a lawyer. And because of that, you're always interested in what are the ways in which you can help protect medical providers, which is essential in this particular case, because a lot of things have changed the fact that we have a pandemic. And so we'd love to hear your thoughts uh, moving forward of what are the things as a medical provider should I be considering before I open my practice and start treating patients? Right. Great question. I think we go back to basics. And the first question comes down to consent. Now, it's patently obvious to anyone who is not living under a rock that there's a pandemic in the background and it's in all 50 states and yes, even in the territories also. Um, so we like to make sure um, that anyone coming to the practice is aware of the pandemic. Of course, they're aware of the pandemic, but get it in writing. Trust, but verify. Um, I would argue that this is no different than the typical informed consent that all patients sign before any type of operation. It should describe broadly the risk and the alternatives. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about a special consent above and beyond the, for the treatment of any type of procedure, which says, hey, look, there's COVID-19 in the background. It's a pandemic. Yes, I know you know about that, but there are risks associated with the pandemic, meaning that although we have taken reasonable precautions to uh, prevent its propagation in our office because there is so much um, so much a high probability of it spreading in the background with a long incubation period, it is impossible to turn that risk down to zero. We wish we could turn it down to zero. It can't happen. So get that in writing. We do have, and I do believe you have this available for Access Plus members, the kind of the template related to this acknowledgement. I, I know it sounds silly to have to go through this, uh, but it's, it's really part of the acknowledgement by the patient that they understand that the world of zero risk does not exist and that you're partners in this going forward. You want to take care of the patient and that acknowledges the background risk. That's awesome. And Michael, what about your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, even post uh, tort reform, you know, in some states like Texas, uh, medical malpractice risk kind of goes to the background in many doctors' minds. And, uh, but even in Texas, uh, you have to acknowledge that COVID-19 related litigation and malpractice litigation is real. I saw an article last week that there have already been 800 and something lawsuits filed over COVID-19 around the country. And now not all of them were malpractice cases, but it just is a, preview of what probably will come and so sound practices um, like this and, and required practices informed consent is a as Jeff said is a is a back to the basics. Yeah so I consider this to be the perfect storm for a trial attorney. Um, why do I say that? It has all of the ingredients. Number one, a high severity event, meaning someone who who develops COVID can potentially die. They could potentially be in a hospital for a long period of time. High severity, high damages. That's number one. Number two, high frequency. It's highly contagious. It's all over the place. So you've already checked two of the wonderful boxes that 
a, um, a trial attorney would love to see. And then number three, the government agencies that are saying, feel free to open up as long as you follow the standard of care. The standard of care for what? It keeps changing on a regular basis. Now, it is true that the Center for Disease Control has guidelines on what to do, but as I look at my list, I see that it changes every week, maybe every 10 days, and we're doing our best to keep up, and they're doing their best to try and disseminate good information. But most people interpret the standard of care to be something that doesn't move a whole lot. So remember those three things, high frequency, high severity, and a evolving standard of care, those are not helpful points to a doctor. Now, it is true that the federal government, as we are taping this, are considering a debate uh, on, um, on uh, immunity for COVID-related lawsuits. Um, will it be full immunity? Will it be um, you know, partial immunity? Will it depend upon um, whether the, uh, there was gross negligence or partial negligence? Will it depend upon the type of case? The truth is, I don't know. I would not hold my breath that that legislation gets implemented as full, complete, and total immunity. Now, that's federally. Then you also have various states that may kick in. But do not underestimate the uh, creativity of a plaintiff's attorney in trying to carve a niche in a, uh, a new space. So get it in writing, get the patient to acknowledge that they understand that there is a risk. Um, it seems crazy that we have to do this, but um, it's a document you definitely want in the patient's chart. Yeah, and, and one thing you've always said on that, which I think is, 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 it's, it's, is the informed consent's the important piece. So make sure that you, and when you can, obviously to explain to them, especially if it's an elective procedure, as to your your immune system may be down and you and you are subject to other viruses besides this and that they understand that so they don't just say it was buried in some paperwork and i didn't realize this and as and as you started the entire thing was you would think they would know after uh being locked up for six weeks or eight weeks depending on where you are that covid 19 is still around and it is a problem but get it in writing as you said and and, and protect yourself so here are a couple pointers we had one of our clients one of the members of medical justice ask okay, so the patient signs the document in my office. How am I supposed to touch that document now? We're trying to engage in proper social distancing. And I hadn't actually thought of that question. So there are a number of potential answers. One would be have the patient sign off on it at home and just send it in by email as one answer. Number two, take a picture of it. Number three would be to just take some gloves, stick it in a corner for four days. Apparently the coronavirus, this particular coronavirus doesn't live on paper for more than four days. And there are probably a thousand other ways to do this, but these are the kind of questions that are reasonably asked when nobody quite knows the, uh, the playbook. Well, that's awesome, Jeff. Thank you so much again for joining us. And, and uh, I think this is your three Pete. Uh, so we're, we're excited to have you back again. All right. Yes, we'll do it again soon. All right. And uh, for those of you all tuning in, it was a great week. Hopefully, we gave you a lot of good information on how to reopen your practice. And if you have not seen the prior videos, we've been, again, covering different pieces throughout the week. So thanks again for joining us.